Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic to entertain myself, to visit with friends uh, old and new, and to learn something. Um, the webinars have been going on now for, I think this is 105. Um, and I guess I'm going to keep going because I've been lining up more guests. We're going to take a short break in September from the, I think the 16th is when we have Becky. So after Becky, I'm going to take a break until October. Um, we've got a bunch of things going on here. So um, that'll let you catch up on the webinars that you haven't seen yet. And um, But we're going to be back full force in October, and I'll keep scheduling guests. If you have any suggestions for someone you'd like me to see on my program, just uh, pop me an email or put it in the chat and um, I'll see what I can do. Um, I have a fair list right now um, and some really interesting guests that I'm working on. Some people are not as easy to get as others. Tracy's really easy, but yay. Inter yay, internet connections can be difficult at times for some people because they live remotely. Um, that said, today my guest is Tracy Broom and um, she's just had a snowstorm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm still in uh, shock. Yeah, so welcome, Tracy. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah. So, Tracy, just for people who haven't uh, heard of you or know what you do, can you just give them a brief, like, background, bio, intro? Oh, sure. Uh, so, I've been doing this for about 20 years, and I started with the Tellington Tea Touch, worked my way into massage, and then landed primarily in craniosacral therapy. But I'm recently bought a few years ago about the Rocky Mountain School of Animal Acupressure and Massage. So it gives me a really good platform to teach fun classes and it's an accredited trade school. So we are able to train people in what I do and including the massage and the cranio and a lot of other really cool guests that we have come in. Um, I trained as a master herbalist just for my own guys, my herd, you know, to keep everybody healthy. Um, and we live here at Zuma's Rescue Ranch, the school, and I live here. We have about 55 horses, so you can imagine bringing them in uh, last night for the storm and uh, preparing stalls and all that. So I, if I look a little tired, I am, <laughs> but everybody was safe. We Everyone made it through at the temperature change of 70 degrees from, we were in the 90s to in the 20s, and we had about three inches. So. Anyway, um, craniosacral is, um, for me, uh, it's just a powerful modality. Uh, it's connected through uh, the shamanic lens. So if anybody is familiar with uh, shamanism or shamanic healing practices, my work is deeply based and rooted in that. So, Can you give us a definition of shamanic practice? Sure. So the shamans are like the, they're the, considered the medicine healers of, the, of a tribe in an indigenous culture how it transitions to Western culture is that we are trained to track and really see everything from the big picture to the, so macro to micro. And you look at, we look at um, uh, what's working and not working within an organism or within even a culture. So if I'm looking here at the rescue and we're moving horses around, I'm trained to look at the really fine details of how, why a herd is, getting along or not getting along and how can we co-facilitate um, helping create peace but also within an organism looking at um, actually going down to the cellular level being able to look at the cellular level so I guess in some worlds uh, some realms they call that um, like being a medical intuitive uh, of some kind um, so we can look from the outside in or the inside out and the cranio pairs well with it because then that gives me the two ways to work with it. There's the light work, which is working with light. If anybody's heard Bruce Lipton's uh, work about how cells that are healthy are lit from within, they have their own nervous system. It's fabulous work. So we, we're working at that level. So um, it can be as complex and science oriented as you'd like. So quantum physics comes into play. And, you know, that's a uh, a lot of people talking about that now. Um, it wasn't as talked about before. And craniosacral has its roots in um, the medical side of things as well as the spiritual and ethereal side. So, well, Linda uh, Tellington Jones has talked about cellular memory and cellular intelligence for mm -hmm. as long as I've known her. Um, yeah. We just had her for my 100th webinar. And 
um, you know, she brought out the point that every cell in your body knows what its job is, yes. right? Which yes. is pretty incredible when you think about it, that they already know. And sometimes they kind of lose their, their way and we have to remind them, but the cells all know what their job is and where they're supposed to be, which when you sit back and think about that and how many, I've forgotten how many trillion cells we have in our body, um, a lot, um, that's pretty remarkable. It's like, it's like taking, you know, all the cars and putting them on the highway and everybody finds their right spot. <laughs> right, exactly. I find it fascinating that, you know, when I, I've studied with a lot of shaman for the last 20 years, uh, mostly from Peru, and uh, my, my main mentor um, is, is uh, we could say a white person in America. So she's out in California, Marty Spiegelman. She's amazing. And she took a lot of their teachings and translated them for us. They speak an ancient language called Quechua. And it's actually a kind of a hybrid of Spanish Quechua now. So it's ancient. So it goes back, I don't even know how many years, but I went to Peru and studied with them. And then we brought, started bringing them here to teach us. So it's just been a fascinating um, add on. And now it's become the core of my teaching. Well, so. that's, that's really awesome. It, it's, uh, uh, it's gotta be interesting to go to, to a foreign country to learn from the shamans in their native environment, um, as opposed to being here. Um, was there something really powerful in one of those experiences when you went there that you remember? So many experiences. It was, you know, people say, oh, you went to Peru. Did you go to Machu Picchu? And I said, you know, yes, but <laughs> the shamans are class masters. They're like, this is not a vacation. This is work. And you're learning to be truly in your own body. And so I'll say that we did, we did probably six days roughing it in tents at high altitudes of anywhere from 10 to 12,000 feet. So that's kind of tough for, even though I'm in Colorado, it was tough. But yeah. what I found was like, we, we use a lot of our own personal energy to effort and they don't use personal energy. They tap into the earth energy and, this, and this, the energy from above. And so they bring them into the center. And I didn't really know what that meant. I heard the words for years and I said, oh yeah, this is so cool. But I didn't really get it until I went there. And when you're hiking at altitude and you're exhausted and maybe we weren't in the, I wasn't in the best of shape when I went there. I thought, oh, this is going to be flat land, right? Uh, no, this was uphill everywhere. There was no downhill. Um, but I realized at some point that I was using so much personal energy and they said, just open yourself up to receiving. And I thought, well, I'm doing that. And they said, not so much. <laughs> so I said, okay, let me think about this. And then I said, oh, I can't think about it. I just have to release and let energy flow in. And then I was able to hike eight to 10 hours a day and not be tired. It, it freaked me out at first, but it was just such a cool aha moment of us not, you know, we don't source very well in our culture. We use a lot of our physicality to walk and move. And so it was just a very important part of my work is that we're not, we don't have to control everything, right? It's like an illusion. And so if we just receive and turn on that receiving button, uh, everything changes and it was very powerful. You know, when I was, I was a research scientist in the 80s at University of Kentucky and I had my accident and I went to Lundis Clinic uh, a year after my accident. And when I came home, I started reading a lot of, uh, a lot of enlightenment books. And one of the series that I read was Carlos Castaneda. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's so interesting because some of the, just a few, I read all of them, but a few things really stuck with me and that was all about a shamanic experience that this guy went on um but following the path of the heart because yes. the other may kill you and you know that's that that and there's another saying in there oh this may all be folly but you've got to do it anyway is basically what it you know um right has stuck with me for so long and it sounds to me listening to you that that it reminds me of that time when i read those books and yeah. got a taste of that teaching where it's uh, again, the quantum physics comes in because it doesn't exist until you, till you acknowledge it, till you see it, mm -hmm. it's in your perception. Right. And, and that's so true for so many things uh, and probably everything and that, you know, like how many times have we wander around with our keys in our hand trying to start our car and we look for an hour, right? That right, um, right. it doesn't exist until we observe. And so it sounds to me like your training 
really works with your cranial sacral work because you have to observe very little things, very subtle, yes. small things. Yes. And usually it's the things that, so when you, when I get called, it's typically the dire circumstances, right? When I get called to work with a horse or a dog or a person even. And so you say, well, you've had all these experts. What can I bring to the table, right? I, I try to come with the child's mind and be humble because what do I know that they didn't know? Which, and I think what happens is when you release and see with the eyes of your heart, it opens a whole new realm of information where you can really just gather all this data that maybe it's that little tiny thing that somebody missed. So I just love the fact that, not that I, and I don't feel like I'm doing this. I feel like it's information that just comes in as, and I'm just a conduit. So if my heart is open and my brain is, you know, someplace else, my ego, it gives me access to this infinite wealth of knowledge about that being and their environment. And it's just super powerful. And I don't think, I, I, I don't think that it's something that I think everybody can do it. I don't I think agree. it's something that's difficult. It's, it's not, I'm not special. I just am trained. Like you said, when you see it, then you see it. Well, like anything, we have to hone our skills. You can't just rely on your innate talent. I mean, we saw that, who was the skier that went to the Olympics and thought he could party the whole time and not train and win? And that was false. So, false. you know, any skill that we have, if we want to really be good at it, we have to work at it. We have to train at it. And every single person that, I've, that I know that's really good at what they do has put in the time to really work at it to be come better. But the other piece that, that resonates with me right now when you're talking about this is heart math. And heart math is proven. There is scientific evidence behind heart math that we know that it really is a real thing. And um, actually, the, the forgotten the guy's name, but the guy who is uh, the creator of heart math is going to be the keynote speaker at the Feldenkrais Symposium starting next weekend. And awesome. yeah, and so, you know, there's data behind that. And you're talking about uh, opening your heart. And that's a theme throughout um, shamanic healing and intuitiveness um, is to come from the heart rather than from the head. And we have scientific evidence that this is a real thing. So when mm -hmm. people start to go, well, that's just wooey. In the past, you know, we used to think that positive, um, uh, you know, imagery was false. But now we know about mirror neurons. And we know that by right. imagining things that we really are affecting our brain and our motor function and our and our outcomes through visual that creative visualization was what it was called in Jane Savoy's um, that winning feeling. So we have so much validation now for what you're saying that I think it's time we recognize that while we may not have all of the scientific data at this point, peer reviewed, double blind experiments, just like with Surefoot, we don't have all that data yet, but we have evidence. It is evidence based. Um, yes. And it's evidence based by the, the sheer numbers that we have that are, um, in your case, healing, and in my case, watching horses heal themselves, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, I think it's really important for us to finally acknowledge that you don't have to understand everything about how it works to acknowledge that it does. I think that's right. a, a really important thing for us to, to recognize. Absolutely. I think, you know, teaching people to do this work, um, I learn a lot from them, but I, I remember teaching in California a clinic and it was, I think it was a level four, I have seven levels in my cranial classes, but um, this person struggled with fixing the horse and doing, and I've always been taught, and, and the shamans will say this, like what you were saying about the cells know their job, but is there something interfering with their function? So our job is really to hold space for the body to recognize where it needs to find balance. And so when we start to think about that, we were looking for what's right in the body to support all the organism, right? The whole organism. So this student, we were doing their final test, and she had this horse, and the horse kept looking at me, and I said, I get it, I'm coming. So. <laughs> I came over and I said, look, the lead mare's watching you. So you're, she's, she's suspicious of you. So she's watching and the horse you're working with is looking at me for help. So here's what we're going to do. You're not allowed to touch the horse. And she said, but how do I do the contacts? I said, you're not doing any contacts. The contacts are simply like when you put your hands on a horse, it's really just to focus energy. It's not to say, I'm going to fix this spot or I'm going to change something for you. That would be really arrogant. We want to be really humble and say, how do I help you turn on your inner healer? Or how do I help you focus on an area where you've dissociated from, right? 
So she, I said, you can sit on the ground here and you can watch this horse or you can stand, it doesn't matter. But all you're going to do is focus on your heart being open and offer love to the horse. And she looked at me like I was crazy. But I said, if, I don't, if, I, if you do anything, I'm going to come and interrupt. So she put her straw hat up on this branch to work. And the lead mare was kind of looking at it. And I said, don't you dare. So she, she kind of wandered off. But anyway, we took before and after pictures. And even though she kind of struggled with not doing something, like not throwing her energy at the horse or trying to go in and look, I said, just be neutral and give her the, the space, hold space for her. Her horse changed the most of the eight horses that we were working with. It was a significant change. And it was really shocking to her that she didn't, she said, but I didn't do anything. And I said, you did, you did what we really wanted to do, which is hold impeccable space and give the horse the opportunity to make a different choice. And meanwhile, the lead mare lady had chewed the whole top of her hat out in this beautiful symbolic, get out of your head, get into your heart moment. So <laughs> it was hilarious. So it was a double uh, teaching. So. Wow. You know, I had Sharon Wilsey on, on Monday and she talked about being a witness that, um, and, and oh, giving the horse space. And it's, I think it's the same thing. We, we use different words, but it's the same idea of you're not doing something to, you're there to be. And the other thing it makes me think of is homeopathy, which is causing the body to heal itself. We're not yes. trying to, you know, uh, stop a process or anything else, but we're trying to cause the inner health of the being to be able to do the job. And, and, um, and I think that, it's, it's so powerful because what what we're saying is that this being has the ability whether it's a horse or a human or a dog or a cat to heal and yes. it makes me think of dr feldenkrais's um what he how he defined health and he defined health as the ability to recover mm -hmm. and that when a system is healthy it can recover it doesn't mean you're not going to have an insult or a sickness but you can recover right. and that a right. being that's not healthy can't recover and therefore is going to have demise right um yes and sometimes that's the case sometimes the individual is not healthy enough to survive but we we have to offer the opportunity and here's where you know sometimes when i listen to the way we talk about illness about going to war and having a battle well you're having right. a battle with yourself and right. so i just think that in in many ways that creates such a conflict from what we're what healing really is Sure. I think it slows down the whole process. And I recently lost my hard horse a few weeks ago um, to a bad accident. <clears throat> and I said to myself, when you look at your own horse and there's nothing you can do, and it, I can change a lot of things, sorry, but <clears throat> he broke his ribs, oh. six ribs. Wow. I, I couldn't change that. And the surgeon surgeon couldn't change it. And so there's this it's time, you know, and so then you're, you're in a different role. You're in the uh, holding space for crossing over. Right. And that's a huge part of shamanic work, as well as I think a lot of healers holding space for the natural process. And it's not about you. It's not about, it wasn't about me, even though I desperately wanted to keep him here. You know, he was one of my favorite horses and he is my favorite horse, but it's, it wasn't my role. My role was to keep him pain-free with the vet until he crossed and so that's also a beautiful gift to be able to give is that to hold impeccable space for a crossing so you know it's just sometimes the, the organism cannot recover from the assault to the body and that's right. very true and if we uh, think that we can fix everything we're in big trouble big you trouble. know i say to my students all the time don't put me on a pedestal because i'll surely fall off really mm -hmm. fast you know oh, yeah. i mean i'm a human and i just i want to impart as much um, knowledge of what I know about energy and, and this work as possible, but we all have to just know that we're still human and it's, it's we're always everywhere. learning. You know, I think that we're that's the, everybody that I know that's at the level that, uh, you know, that you're at is we put ourselves in the position of student as opposed, yes. as opposed to know all. And, and yes. it's like you say, child's mind or student's mind so that we keep open to the possibilities and keep learning. And I think that's really, really important. You know, you bring up another point that I just want to touch on for a moment. And that's, um, you know, 
one of the most popular books at the turn of the century of the of the 20th century was a book on dying from pneumonia basically that was the single biggest cause of death was pneumonia and so they had books on dying and we looked at death as a natural process which it is but mm -hmm. somehow in the 21st century we have gotten um a lot of people have gotten removed from this and so that when a death does occur it's a huge trauma instead of an acknowledgement of this is part of life um, and I think horse people are closer to it because we're around animals and dogs and cats and, and they do not yeah. live as long as we do and they pass. Um, but, you know, it's it, uh, grieving is a part of life and grieving is an, a, a really important emotion that we need to acknowledge and to go through and to give the animal the space as well as, yes. as opposed to, you know, imparting our desire to fix on the animal at, at, when it's not able to be here anymore um exactly and so, yeah and for me it was i needed to take him to the clinic to be sure i was making the right choice so of course we did all the science of like x-rays ultrasounds all the things that can this be repaired does he and then i asked him do you want to stay and he said no so you know he has the ultimate just he made the ultimate decision and i think you know here at zoom is we have um a process of ceremony and ritual when a horse passes and so i think what helps me process grief which i think is missing from a lot of people's lives is that part of it's the ritual which is honoring that life and so we when we dig the trench not to be morbid but we drink, dig the hole here on the ranch and bring the body in we all circle around and do pipe, native american pipe ceremony oh, and wow. it is it's beautiful and we all say prayers for his safe passing and i think that that doesn't always happen for people and so you you sort of stay in that grief mode and you're spinning your wheels as far as like how do you move forward um maybe it's it be, the process gets delayed i think so i feel like doing ritual in whatever way it is for you like a candle ceremony or something you know just something to honor the life and the relationship is huge but most people sit in grief that they're not here anymore. And there's going to be that. But I feel like for me, I know he's there with me. He's here now. You know, it's like he's always going to be with me. It's even maybe even more powerful. And, and a simple way to think about that is even if you don't believe that the actual spirit is there, they are there in your memory. Therefore, they do yes. exist and they are still yes. alive in your own memory of them. Yes, um, absolutely. And, you know, it's really hard right now for a lot of people because with COVID, that's been a yeah. huge problem is that there hasn't been a, uh, a way to be with that dying person. And I'm sure that there's probably people listening to this webinar that have experienced that. And so it's, but I think it's important that they come up with, uh, that, that, that we would come up with our own process of ritual, like you say, it, it, not in the presence of, but in, in um, honor of. Yes. For that yes. healing process. Absolutely. And you know, ritual can be for other things, you know, so honoring a lot of things. And so weddings are a ritual, right? For me, a ceremony of a wedding or, you know, that's, and that's a happy comparison, right? But birthdays, there are all these things can be ritualistic in nature. And so the shamans would say it's a celebration and it's a celebration of life, really, regardless of the, that particular focus. And I just want to point out, like, I have my my uh, Life is Good t-shirt with this particular horse, which they stopped making for a while. I was very upset. And then they started, so I bought a bunch. But my little horse, Andy, had a big white blaze like that. He was a little sorrel horse with a white blaze. And he passed a number of years ago from botulism, actually, which was unheard of in where I live. Um, and but you know this is my ritual that i i often wear my life is good t-shirts because it's got andy on it and right. then he's always at my heart you know <laughs> so. exactly i love that that's so cool yes so you, i think there's a lot of um to with the crania work it's also called the breath of life and you know a lot of people don't know that spiritual side of it um, but for me doing a session is ritual it's being in a sacred space or a sacred container because for me to be able to touch a horse or a dog or a human there's a that's intimate that's like mm -hmm. it's a, a thing someone to put their hands on and hold space for you to be vulnerable enough to make a change or even just look maybe you just want to look at something that's happening for this horse um and they it, i feel like that's 
really sacred. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, now in this time of COVID, again, you know, like touching has become taboo. You know, you don't give somebody a hug. You don't go over and put your hand on their shoulder. You stay six feet away. Um, right. And so it's a very interesting time right now because I was talking to Glenn yesterday and we talked about how, um, you know, we're more, and Sharon also said it, we're more like horses right now because we're constantly mm -hmm. aware of our environment and wondering, is that person Oh, you know, safe. Is that person okay? Can I allow that person near me? Which is so much like what horses are always doing, kind of scanning their environment, making sure everything's okay. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have this sort of bigger bubble right now. And, sure. and it's so obvious when you go near someone and, and they're not willing to have you in their bubble or you're not willing to have them in and that we have to get permission, just like we yep. need to ask permission from the horses to be able to do that. So I think this is a super time for us to actually use this uh, pandemic time to heighten our senses to understand what our horses experience all the time. Absolutely. And there are shamanic exercises that they, so in, in indigenous cultures, in, like in Peru, they are much more like horses in the sense that they will observe someone's energy and their field and say, they go through a process of energetic permission asking to step forward and, or energetically engage. And then they decide if that's a person they would actually want to approach and engage in a conversation or physical touch. There's, and it's an unspoken, probably happens in 30 seconds situation that they just, that's their culture. So I thought that was fascinating because yeah. everyone always wants to come and, you know, before COVID, come and hug. But I, I like to know the person who I'm hugging before I like just hug on, you know. So, and I'm not a cold fish, but, you know, it's just, I think I've learned that from them is like, what if somebody is dealing with a lot of angst or some kind of energy situation that you don't necessarily want that turbulence in your field? And I think the horses are the same exact way. They're like, oh, you're cranky. I, I, I'm going to run to the other side of the pasture because I don't want you catching me in that mood. Right. And that's fair. That's fair. So I think it's, it's a, a, like you said, a great opportunity for us to practice, like, how am I in my own energy? Am I in fear or can I be happy and joyous and still give people space? It doesn't have to be fear-based. It can be, oh, no. hey, we're, we're respecting each other's space and this is really cool and I see you. And what I see is like, you can see the smile in people's eyes now because you can't see their yeah, mouth. Yeah. So you see the crinkle eyes and I'm like, that's so cool. Like we can still give emotional feedback with our eyes and our body language. So I just love that. Yeah, I, I just think it's an opportunity and, and the more we can realize that there are opportunities in what seems like a horrible situation, a cons it's a constraint. And yes. how do we respond to the constraint? And the other thing that I always think of is um, Lenny Bruce that kind of dates me a little. I remember watching his movie when I was 16, but he went through the, the emotions of anger, denial, fear, rejection, acceptance. And, mm -hmm. and it was repeated and repeated the movie, anger, denial, fear, rejection, acceptance. And so you can watch people going through these different emotional states. And of course, if somebody's angry about this, you don't really want them, you know? And if somebody's in denial, you're kind of like, okay. And if they're fearful, you know, it's like, well, I can at least understand your fear. And then you get the ones that are like, yeah, but the horses do this, right? We, our interaction yeah. with the horses, we reject it. And then we finally come to this level of acceptance and it's not mm -hmm. a linear line. It's, it's, you know, back and forth and up and down and around and around. But the, these are the emotionals, emotions that we go through. That's part of the process. It's also part of the process of grieving. It's part of the process of life. And it's part of the process we go through with our own horses when we run into trouble. Yes, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yesterday I was out um, and I noticed that one of the horses, one of our senior girls was still out. And I said, why is she still out? And it, I, I just went in and put her halter on and, and she was a little bit like wired and, you know, like wide eyed. And I said, well, it's cold out here. I'm really cold. How about we walk in together, put her halter on and walked in. They were like, how did you get her? Catch her. She's just been wild. And I said, well, we had an opportunity to like, just go together. So I think it's interesting. You know, my energy, I didn't know she had been hard to catch. Right. I just knew she, like she was in distress and there was no other horse around. So I thought, well, oh, we'll better bring her in. So it's just interesting to, to not have that, like, you know, I don't, it, it, there's a, a fluidity of engagement that happens when you just ground center and say, Hey, let's do this together. 
and acknowledge the obvious, right? Yeah. You're stressed, You're I'm right. stressed, it's gonna be nasty out here. Let's go inside, you'll be better off. <laughs> Exactly. Let me help you. Uh, cool. All right. So we've, wait, I'm sure that you had a topic to talk about, but I think this has been a really important conversation because I think that we've touched on a lot of things that people are wondering about. And I know that your topic is cranial sacral with a twist. So, I think this is the twist. I mean, yeah. that's what I to talk about was like this part of it right yeah <laughs> i love it yeah so um did anybody have any questions is anybody percolating let's see we got a somebody on the chat um they just really like what we're yakking about <laughs> like amen to honoring the last episode of life somebody's put up the bruce lipton video uh link and just you know good analogies so 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 when you approach cranial cycle with the twist um you're talking about including the shamanic concepts in your work yes. totally it's uh because when i teach a lot of my students come to the classes and say well, this isn't really craniosacral. If, if they've had craniosacral before, and I say, well, it is, but we're looking at it with an expanded state of awareness, which is that sh it's the shamanic way of looking. So if you can start to learn this way of seeing and how to expand your awareness away from self, total awareness on the other, they call it luminous awareness. Wow. Luminous awareness, it's beautiful. They call our energy field luminous or luminous architecture. And I thought, oh, this is really cool. So when I started learning that and I uh, was studying with Marty Spiegelman, I found it interesting. She said, Tracy, I want you to come take a cranial class with me. And I said, but Marty, I've been certified for a long time. Um, and I don't really like working on people as much as I do animals. I do it, but I, it's like I'm selective. Hey, so you know she, what? I always say if you have uh, fur or clothes, I'm OK. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. That's exactly right. So she said, I think you should take this class and I will give it to you. And I thought, uh oh, she, she's thinking there's something I don't know. So I better take this class and take up that opportunity. And it changed everything because she helped me mold it uh, into the shamanic lens, as well as looking at what's talking in the body and what's not talking in the body. And so she works a lot with what she calls the interface. And so the interface is where, like, if you're looking at a body that looks like a horse that looks like it's squished, you know, like the pelvis is dipped, but it looks like everything's kind of like an accordion pushed in. I could say, if I put my hand on the lumbar and this, uh, the lumbar and the sacrum, I could say, what's the conversation, the interface between the lumbar and the sacrum? Where do they meet, and how are they talking? And if the horse is really squished in, it could be that, and there's a lot of could there, there's compression. And when there's compression, then there's not fluidity of movement because the body is held in compensation. And so it really got me thinking about all these horses and, and dogs that, you know, their posture revealed that they were not in ease, they weren't in fluidity. And so could we look at an interface energetically because there's no physical tangible there except unless there is like um, arthritis or there's some remodeling or, or there's the the posture is placing them in such compression that you do have a diminishment of space. But if it's energetic and it's not a, like a um, fusion, can we talk to the body and show them that spot and say, could there be space here? All of a sudden the body starts to open and it's not me doing anything. We're offering a suggestion to the body to say, do you want space here? And the body will say, oh, that'd be really great. <laughs> I'd love to have a little space in my lumbar sacrum because I feel like I'm really jammed there. And then all of a sudden you start to feel this movement, but it's at that interface. So that changed everything for me. And I rewrote my classes and I only teach from that lens. Yeah. And so I'm very grateful to Marty for you know, pushing me because again, I thought, oh, well, I've been doing this for a long time, you know, seven years, eight years. Why would it, what, what does she know that I don't know, you know, so, because I said it in a, with a lot of people, and it wasn't an ego thing, it was more like, oh, I'm so busy, and I don't have the time, and then I thought, oh, I'm making the time, because there's something juicy here, right, and, you know, so do you still feel mind. cranial rhythms when you're doing it this way, yes. okay, you do for the most part, if you're looking at, so my classes, the, there's two classes, there are two classes I teach that are visceral work, which is not traditionally done with animals, and it's not manipulative, it's all energy. So in that case, we're feeling for life force. So we're looking at vitality, functionality of like, let's say, 
liver, spleen, what's happening there. So I remember working with a horse on the East Coast who looked gorgeous. And I, I put my hands on him and I thought, oh my gosh, he's dying. And I thought, why did I say that? And so I go to the owner and she's been my client for a long time. And I say, I think he's dying. And she said, oh, for goodness sake, you're, you're being dramatic. Well, they took him to the clinic because I said that and it freaked her out. Well, his spleen was so enlarged that he had some massive internal infection that they hadn't, it hadn't shown on the outside yet, but the spleen was so huge they couldn't reduce it and he died. And I thought, yeah. And I thought to myself, this is how I wrote this. Why I wrote this program was, wow, I must have missed it because he was a client of mine for a long time. And they said, this is a chronic low grade infection that he's had forever. And the spleen just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I, and I was so mad at myself for like not knowing enough about the spleen. And I thought I, gotta, I have to educate myself. And so I went back and I really studied an anatomy, internal anatomy and functionality and how all the systems talk to each other. And that's not traditional cranial work that I was taught, you know? So I think that there probably are schools of cranial that teach that, I, so, but I maybe haven't attended them. And, and I don't know of any that do that work for animals, but where it helps me with horses is in a colic situation or, um, and, you know, where I can sense an infection and say, oh, we need to call the vet. We need to do some blood work. We need to do, you know, something. So it gives me, a, it gives us an edge, right? Like gets us ahead of something. You know, you make me think of something that, um, I don't know if you know who John Zahork is. He's the, mm -hmm. he created Anatomy and Clay. Um, where you have a model of a horse and you build oh, the muscles right. from the inside yeah. out. He's actually in Colorado. And um, I organized, this is before, before 2000, actually it was between 2001 and 2004, I think it was. Um, I organized four courses with him here in Virginia and we did the horse, the advanced horse, the human, and then we did a comparative where we did dog, horse, human, and two stances. But the thing that I want to bring out about that was he, he told us about a time when someone had a shoulder injury. And so what they did was they got the shoulder model because he has one that's just the shoulder and they built the muscles of the shoulder. And as they built the muscles, the, pro the pain went away. And, Interesting. And, and, and you're kind of, what you're talking about is resonating with me in that as we start to understand a system, with that knowledge, we can then um, influence or acknowledge or recognize that system. But yes. again, it's the awareness and we can't recognize it unless we understand it. And so it drove you back to understanding the internal organs. And yes. by doing that, now you can tap in or connect, if however you want to call it, to the internal organs because you have a clear understanding of them. And, exactly. and it just kind of, that was the thing that came to my mind is that this, um, the more we understand a system, then the, it's kind of like, how do I want to describe it? It's like we have a, if we have a blob of clay, it's just a blob of clay. But as we start to mold it, we understand it can be something. And as it's something, we see it, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. So I always honor that horse because had he not shown me that and I not felt this incredible, like, oh, wow, I don't know a lot, you know, about this. And so how do we work with that? And that goes back to Bruce Lipton about the light in the cells. So now if I look at a, a spleen that's enlarged and I can see, oh, wow, there's a, like the cells are starting to dim. They become dim. And then they begin, and, and there's an opportunity in that moment to ask the horse, can we increase your chi or your life force and light that cell back up together? Or is it your time and, and the, we've hit the tipping point and there's too many cells that are checking out and, and now we've had too much cell loss and the, the organism can't survive. And so that for me is fascinating. I have a lot of stories about that, but I, you know, if you had asked me 20 years ago if I'd be doing this type of work, I'd say, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. What do you mean bringing light? What? So I had to get over a bunch of hurdles of like, but I need to know what, where's the science in that? You know, because my brain works that way. It wants to know what, why does it that happen? What happens? And, and then can I repeat or have that same outcome again and and oftentimes it's not not possible most of the time it's not possible so i just surrender to the process
You know, this uh, I so resonate with you because, you know, I'm a sci I have a master's degree in equine reproductive physiology. So I always run everything through my scientific lens and it's how I've been able to, to teach riding because I keep going back to the physics of it, right? And when right. somebody says something that does not match with the physics, I'm like, you know, forget it. But it's like with Surefoot, it's driven me crazy because I didn't have the science of it. And it's why I've started doing all these webinars. And the more webinars I do, the more understanding I get. And one of the benefits for me is understanding my horse's hoof so much more. Um, and then make, you know, I've taken information from these webinars and utilized it to improve my horse's hoof health. Um, mm -hmm. And I've, and it's the same thing as we have to keep being willing to investigate and to research and to look. And even if we don't have the ultimate answer, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. Um, right. You know, they didn't know about air until they discovered it, but we were all breathing up until that point. <laughs> right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. Can you give us a, a very simple example of, say, um, uh, how you would see the the uh, the difference in the way you worked before, say with a, like with uh, cranial work, you would have put your hands on and felt a cranial rhythm, right? And how yes. you approach that now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I feel like I have to be way more in my heart, you know, the theme of being in my heart, because if I open my heart and I put my hands on, the information comes into my awareness like a flood. And so before I would have to like feel for the rhythm and it was felt more, um, I would say functional and methodical, which is not a bad thing because there are a lot of um, therapists who do that work and, it, and they're very powerful with it. But for me, it's more about forgetting the form of the function, form and function and just feeling what's under my hands. And so um, that interface piece, because it's energetic, is where everything happens. So it's just like when we we're talking about meeting somebody and feeling their energy, you, your energy field and the edge of your field is already perceived before the brain, you know, acknowledges that feeling of I need to move away. It's like touching a hot stove for our energy field. So, so I, I just want to kind of explore this a little bit because there is also the importance of learning a technique. Yes. Um, and, you know, you spent eight years really perfecting your technique so that you could then move to the heartfelt intuitive side. And again, that's when I think about learning the Tellington touches or somebody doing Masterson or even working with Surefoot pads, um, there's a certain amount of technique that we need to get down and make it um, at first, it's like, that's the only thing we can think about. And then we start to get a little better and we can start to notice other thing was happening with other feet, right. blah, blah, blah. But we need to practice our technique until that becomes what some people would call con unconscious competent. Exactly. Right. So the four phases are unconscious, incompetent, conscious, incompetent, conscious, competent, and unconscious competent. Meaning yeah. that we start out not knowing, we, we start to realize we don't know, we get better, but we have to pay attention, and then we don't have to think about it. And I use, you know, driving the car for a teenager as a classic example. Now you drive the car for thousands of miles and, you know, you're like, oh, did I pass that exit? <laughs> yeah, right. How did I get this far on my journey? Right. I was thinking of things. Yes, exactly. And I feel like that piece of it for me is like, I don't, I, I, my brain is much, it's much easier for my brain to go off, offline as far as it's, the shamans would describe it this way. The brain is a database. It collects data. When we, when we step away from that, that's 2% of our brain, right? We're using, that's like the linear side, the ego structure is included in that mental capacity and mental realm. But the intuitive side is from the heart and that's the 98% where we tap into everything else that's around us. And that allows new information to come in because the brain only knows what it knows. Right. And so it's like, you know, it's based in memory experience and, and it, it's beautiful that way. It's, not, it's, it's a good thing that we have a database because then we can learn our technique. And, and then our intuitive side says, okay, just put your hands here and feel and experience. It's completely uh, away from that linear, okay, I'm gonna define it. Because once you name it, you lose it. And I say this to my students a lot. Once you say, oh my gosh, I'm feeling the cranial rhythm, you are no longer in the rhythm. 
you've gone into the mental realm, right? right? So you have to stop doing that, but it takes practice. You have to, you know, it's like creating the neural pathways for hang in that feeling and don't try to change it, define it. Judge it, name it. it. Yeah, exactly. Because I can do that later when I get, you know, I'm finished with holding space and being in that moment and, and being incredibly present. If I'm not present and I go to, to words and, and, and I guess, I mean, you'd say language puts you in the thinking brain. It's linear. So what comes in at lightning speed is the feeling and the energy. And then it goes into our central nervous system. It's processed as data. And if we're conscious and we're, we're really looking at it, it becomes a part of a map in our brain. That's how, how my brain works anyway. And I think everybody's does, but it's, it becomes more of an infrastructure for the healing work. So they complement each other. It's quite beautiful. Yeah. And we really, you do need both because otherwise yeah. it's what, you know, you, what do you do with, with the overall picture? Like, so, you know, I keep going back to Feldenkrais because that's where my training is. And Feldenkrais would talk about differentiation and then integration. And mm -hmm. so when you're in that present space, you're really present with what's happening there. And then we need to think about, well, how does this function as a whole and kind of put it all back together again so that there is an improved function. Um, yes. and, but the being present, and that's the piece that I pick up when you're talking is, um, you know, that's the piece that is we we're not really trained to be present we're actually trained to be uh dissociative when you think yes. about so much of our uh, the way we're taught to learn things and it also brings up a point that you don't have to always be a hundred percent present in fact most people aren't and neither are their horses and yet so often we demand the horses a hundred percent attention not acknowledging that we don't give them a hundred percent exactly it's true. I mean, I don't know how many, I, you've probably seen it a million times, people texting or talking on their cell phone while riding and the horse is just supposed to keep doing what it's doing, which you've asked it to do, but you're not present for them. Like you're not giving them attention and they don't, they're, they're really kind to us for the most part, most often. <laughs> but, <laughs> You know, my stallion would knock my phone out of my hand. It, the one who just passed away, he'd come up, he'd grab it, he'd throw it on the ground. And I thought, you're right. It's very disrespectful. I'm in your space and I'm not. You're not your there. Space. Yeah. I'm not there. You know, the animals are the ones like the cats and the dogs that always, when you get on the phone or the children. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the barking starts and you're like, ah, but yeah. it's true, you know, and, and that's probably the hardest thing I think for people to learn with the cranial work is in, in meditation too, it's not just cranial work, it's any presence, type of presence where you have to quiet your thoughts so that you're not in a hundred different places and multitasking and thinking about what you're doing tomorrow and what just happened with your, you know, housemate or your husband or wife or whatever. Yeah. We have to be so present in the fact that if I am not present, I'm missing it. I'm missing all those little details. So in the minute my, or even if you're like listening to music and a song is stuck in your head, that happens to me all the time. So I'm like, okay, you stop it. And I have to say to my brain, okay, you need to do your job. So I give my brain a job to do. Um, Say so I say your job is to remember everything impeccably so that I can just experience and feel. And it works 90% of the time. I'm going to have to try this because you know what wakes me up in the morning is hot flashes because my brain starts and I can feel it. I can feel the thought start and the wheel kicks in and all of a sudden the hot flash appears. And I'm like, yeah. uh, can you please just, you know, can, can I just sleep? <laughs> I just want to rest. I need rest. Yeah, and it's not always easy to turn at that off. It's less e easy in, the, you know, like I recognize in the connection between the thoughts and the hot flashes, but um, I, I was better at it. I don't know why I have to go back to practicing. But, you know, the, the thing is that people think that being present is something that either they have or they don't have. Um, it's a fluid concept, right? Well, I think it's also, again, going back to developing a skill that yes. to, to, be, to become present, we have to practice at becoming present. We're, it's not going to happen if we don't practice being present. And it doesn't mean it's perfect. And I think this is where, you, you know, meditation is such a, has a lot of, um, uh, stuff type, you know people hear the word meditation and, whoa, you know i gotta sit there with a the flame and cross-legged and but 
what the purpose of meditation is to help us learn to be present with our thoughts, not to control our thoughts, but to right. allow them to flow. Exactly. Um, and yes. that's a particular type of meditation that I studied years ago was called Vipassana. And it was hmm. about neither craving nor aversion, not attaching to the thoughts, not trying to hang on to the good ones and not trying to chase away the bad ones, but to let it go through and then continue to focus on oneself. Um, so it's very different in that you're not focusing on a sound or a, a flame or anything like that. It's you, you and your body. Um, but it, it, it is a practice and it's not an achievement. <laughs> I think that that being right. present is really, um, we don't have presence. We have to practice being present. It's true. And I, what I say to a lot of my students is you don't have to sit cross-legged, like you said, in front of a flame. You can be in nature and be fully present as you walk because you're paying attention to step by step, your breath, you're paying attention to who you are, where you are. Mm -hmm. And so the thoughts can still be flowing, but if you have gratitude and you open your heart, it also takes you into a deeper awareness. And so you can notice the trees and notice and, and give gratitude for this beautiful space you're in. And that's a form of meditation because you're not trying to control anything. You're just in the experience of feeling. And you can do that with your horse also. And that's the thing is those moments when we're just with our horse, not asking our horse anything where, you know, the horse is peaceful, he's had his dinner, um, and just being in the presence of and with or without contact. And then if you're going to make contact, and I think you'll agree, a simple exercise for people would be to simply put their hand on without expectation, not trying to influence, not trying to change, but just you know, feel the texture of the coat, the warmth of the horse, the surface of the skin, anything under the skin. And that's just a simple way for people to get started. For sure. And I, again, my stallion Finn is his name that just passed. He would, if you, if he wanted to be with you, he would come and he would face you and he'd put his head next to your head. So you'd be like his cheek by your, your cheek. But if you touched him, he'd bite you. Oh, <laughs> He'd say, no, this is how I want you to be with me, right? So he, he taught me very well. I would say, oh, we're just being right now. And I'd, ha I'd stand there and breathe with him. And our breathing would entrain. And you, it was the most magical moments of peace in my heart. And I think, how many times do we do that where we don't have to physically touch? We feel, because what happens with me, it, I think with all of us, is, oh, there's a little tangle in your mane. I'm just going to work on that for a second. But mm. then, then you're working on the main and you're not really being present with them as a soul or a sentient being right. so and it's okay to work on the main there's a time and place to do that yes. but there's also a time and place to just have this peaceful moment um uh my horse actually requests that i rub his ears and that is <laughs> He's so cute because his massive head and he puts it down and I, I just, you know, and that's, he gets me to do some work for him to make him feel better. Yes, but, that's um, nice. but it's such a peaceful moment for the two of us. And it's so, it's just, we both really enjoy it um, to see his, his face smile when I do that. Um, yeah. And you have no agenda. That's the beautiful thing. It's not like, okay, I have 15 minutes to do this. It's just, we're going to do this and it be fully in that moment and he's enjoying it. You're enjoying it. It's like, it's perfect. And that's meditation to me. Yeah. That's yeah. form of meditation. And so that's something anybody can, can do is, you know, when you get to the barn, if you're really stressed, go clean the stall first. And then, <laughs> you know, at some point with your horse, just spend just two minutes, just mm -hmm. two minutes, not, with any great expectation and within the comfort of the bubble. In other words, if the horse is in the stall and maybe you're outside the stall or maybe you're inside the stall or maybe you're right next to him or maybe you're hands on, but to figure yeah. out where that boundary is for that moment. And that can change mm -hmm. moment to moment. Absolutely. Um, and it doesn't mean that, and this is the other side of it, that the, it doesn't mean that the horse can invade your space. They have to, you know, there's this mutual respect. And I think that that's one of the things um, I always feel that if someone, if I want respect from someone, I have to give that respect first, but there's got to be a mutual respect. And if I feel like there's an invasion on my space, I can create the boundary as well. So it's not about space invading or anything like that. It's just mutually communing, I guess. Yeah, for sure. And I always find it interesting because all the horses here, uh, 
it's one of the things that the volunteers have to learn really fast is that if the horse says no, let's figure out why they're saying no or change your orientation to the situation and, and breathe and, and relax. And I can catch any horse here, not because I'm an excellent horsewoman. It's because I'm reading the situation and honoring their, their, how they're communicating with me moment to moment. And I think that that's what I see, what makes me sad when I go to barns and I see people grooming their horse to get ready to ride. It's very abrupt and they're just brushing and getting this job. It's like getting a job done versus enjoying the journey with them and like saying, oh, around the face, maybe the horse is flinching and like backing up and they're yelling at them. And, and I'm thinking, why, why are you with them? Like, is it, what, what about it is peaceful for you in this situation? Because it's definitely not peaceful for them. And I'm not judging that. It's just. You're observing I, it though. I'm observing and I'm seeing that the horse is not really enjoying that moment. And maybe the ride is better. I, you know, I don't always get to see all that. But I think, I hope that I have, can carry that level of mindfulness regardless of what has to get done. And I, I can worm my horses without a halter because we, it's not dramatic and forceful. It's, there's this conversation we have about it, right? Like, and when I say conversation, I can put my hand on the nose, show them the wormer and give it to them. That's not how we started. These are off the track thoroughbreds. So <laughs> yeah. There were crazy antics, you know, for years about until I realized how to ask properly and how to engage properly. So it's just, it's an interesting shift. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's, we're not perfect. And I, I'm the first yeah. one to admit it that, you know, for everything that I know and everything that I do, I still have moments when of course it's, you know, it, it's like, I get frustrated about something and, you know, the horses are mirroring that and I yell at them, <laughs> you know? Um, and I, but I think that's really important to be honest about that because it's, yes. you know, I, and that's the other thing is that when I was a kid, the way we handled horses was very different than the way we look at them now. We have really grown in our understanding and our knowledge, but it doesn't mean the old habits are gone. It's just that we right. don't use them as much, and there are occasions when they come back. And I think in that moment, it's also really good that we're kind to ourselves and not beat ourselves up for not doing it perfectly and not getting it right yes. every time. Exactly. And, and with that concept, the horses... Under, they go, oh, okay, you had a, you know, you, you had a bad moment. Well, sometimes I bite another horse too when I'm grumpy. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. When, if you're getting tossed around, there's a, there is a time when you have to get your energy big. And so, so we have to survive with them. And so I, I acknowledge that for myself as well. Like, you know, walking a stallion by mares or, you know, when he's like, I'm going over here and you're trying to you're like, ah, so we have that frustration that comes up and then, but it's all in how we respond, right? And, and do we carry it forward? Or do so, we let it go? Yep. Or we let it go. And they're pretty good at letting us let it go if we let them, yeah. right? They're, they're supportive, they forgive us. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the harder part is that we don't forgive ourselves. Yes, I beat myself up all the time and it's not helpful. Guilt mm -hmm. and worry and all these things are, they're emotions that are natural, but they aren't very productive. Useful. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we can acknowledge them, but then we have to move on. So, yes. well, Tracy, this has just been fascinating. So if there was one thought or concept that you'd like to leave our viewers with today from this conversation, because we've kind of been all, uh, all over all the place, the place, but all in the same place at the same time, if you will. <laughs> right. I think that the, no, the knowledge that you, from, if you get nothing else from this, if you can be heart-centered and just means focus on love in your heart and hang with your horse, you, you can change anything, including a physical issue or an emotional issue. And it may take time, but I feel like all of us can do that. And, um, and if you decide you wanted to, to pursue a skill like Feldenkrais or Tellington Touch or Craniosacral, or whatever that modality is, there are different modalities that resonate with different people. Absolutely. And, but with that heartfelt mindfulness is what is the key for me in approaching the healing work. So if I think if everybody can do that, um, I think we're, we're just going to be happier as a, as a species. And think about with the, and, and I don't want to bring COVID up again, but when we crave touch and we have our horses and our dogs they're they're able to provide a safe avenue for touch right now that we don't aren't able to get from other humans 
Yeah. So I think that's huge. I think we're the lucky ones because we are animal lovers and we, we can have that contact and it's such an unbiased and un, uh, you know, there isn't the, all the stuff attached to it with our animals. They're just honest and they're just present. Yeah. And it's really nice. Exactly. And um, stay, uh, Tracy, there's been a lot of people just saying this is exactly what they needed today. Oh, I'm That's so really glad. Great. Thank you so much for joining so, us. So um, now it's been a blast. I've really enjoyed this conversation, and it's really great because it's a. I think it's allowed us to talk about stuff that some people think are eh, it's kind of fringy, kind of weird, but really it's based in science. It is based yes. in science, it whether is. that's coming from the heart or perception or sensitivity to touch or the cells really, you know, emitting energy that, that it, these are real definable things that you can actually measure. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the other one that is that mind mapping. I don't know if uh, the one that Linda did a long time ago to yes. see how the mind is working. So these are measurable things, but fortunately we don't need to have the equipment to measure because it's, we own, we just have to own it. It's ours to have. And, and we see the results, right? You can yeah. see the change in the horse is like, instantaneous when you are coming from that space well, like just suddenly they ju it just changes and and who needs a barometer when we have you yeah know, the biggest biofeedback unit on the planet right? <laughs> exactly <laughs> oh tracy i've really enjoyed having this chat with you it's um, I, I, we, we just to let you all know that i made it two hours earlier for her than i was supposed to um so she really got it uh had to hurry to kind of get it together but i'm so grateful that you did this has just been fabulous and i've so enjoyed this conversation so thank you very much thank you so much wendy Yep. And thank you everybody for joining us. Just remember you can see this and all of the webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. And if you subscribe to my email at murdochmethod.com, you'll get the emails that tell you when the guests are coming up. And that's uh, on that website is where you register for the courses now. And I keep posting them up as I bring on new guests. So just remember, we're going to take a break from September 17th to the beginning of October. I'm not sure exactly which day I'm coming back. It's the Monday. I think it's the second. Um, but we'll pop out an email so that you know and um, we'll continue these conversations so thank you again Tracy and thank you everybody thank you. for joining us today and just have a marvelous day bye bye bye